exclusively to control weeds. That was only five years ago. Isn't it true that if farmers followed the advice Monsanto was giving, they would have Roundup resistant weeds in their fields today? Yes. Okay, anyone else? Yes. I uh, received that advice and yes. Uh, Professor Mortensen, but Monsanto made a lot of money with farmers following that advice. Isn't it true that Monsanto's Roundup Ready seeds and Roundup herbicide virtually took over the market and that's what exerted natural selection pressure on weeds to select for resistance to Roundup? Yes, it, Prof it is. Professor Zoen and Weller, to resolve the problem of herbicide resistance and weeds going forward, you both put your faith in public education to inform farmer decisions. That sounds a lot like the plan that got us into the problem we currently have, excuse me, saying. At what point would your policy recommendations expand from a sole reliance on public education efforts? In your view, is there ever a role for federal regulation? Professor Owen. I, th I think there has to be a role for regulation at some point. My, you know, in, in trying to envision this and anticipating the question uh, before I arrived here, uh, I, I was basically at, at, at loggerheads trying to figure out how that could be actually implemented because I see what has been relatively effective in my opinion with regard to IRM, insect resistance management. But the biology of the insects and the biology of the weeds are so much different that I, I, I'm having trouble seeing how that type of, of regulatory action would have any impact. Professor Weller. Well, I, I agree with D Dr. Owen when he says the difference between insects and weeds. From my perspective, from a regulatory role, I would like to see what people would come up with as far as the basis for that. The, this, the comment on education is to provide the grower with scientific backed facts about what are the best ways to manage weeds. We, we know what happened when, when farmers followed the recommendations from Monsanto, Roundup, Roundup, Roundup. It's not good, we knew that. And I think from our point of view, we did counter that from the university point of view. Well, well let me but, ask you this. I think the other, the other comment that, that many farmers believed it, and it did make their weed control quite efficient for several years until the selection pressure resulted in weeds that weren't as well controlled. Well, here's, here's the point that I'm making. I mean, how far along do you keep saying, well, use public education, you know, what happens if you reach the point of its infestation that uh, is predicted by Syngenta scientists, uh, 38 million acres of row crops? Uh, well, do we still talk public education? Then? I think, I, from my perspective, that Syngenta comment is based on using only Roundup, not using an integrated weed management approach. Okay. And, now what, and that, that good point. Would, would result in exactly the catastrophe that, that we've been talking about here today. So what would be the tipping point? to consider other policies, even a federal role, aimed at mitigating the spread of herbicide-resistant weeds? Well, I think, I would think one thing that we've learned in the last five years, and Mike and I have been involved in a six-state study looking at weed management and Roundup Ready crops and other rotations, we have seen a change in farmers' approaches to management based on a lot of the best management practices that have been coming out from the universities. Whether you can force farmers to do that without regulation, I don't know. Mr. Uh, Professor Owen, did you want to jump in on that one? Yes, yes, I did. Um, and, and Dr. Willer makes a good point. Can you force farmers to change? Um, I don't think so. And, e and even if you could, I don't know how you would enforce it. At your point about, okay, how far do we wait? Well, we should have been doing this all along. Mm -hmm. And a number of us made those recommendations and continue to make those recommendations. But at the, you know, for example, in Iowa, we have approximately 1.25 FTEs dedicated to extension and weed science. Let me, let, me, let me ask Professor Mortensen to, to uh, jump in here. At what point, Professor, do you think it's time for the USDA and the EPA to step in with regulations aimed at preventing the spread of herbicide resistance in weeds? I, I 
am of the opinion that uh, that this is. I think I think we're at that point. So I'm I'm of the opinion, you know. And I, I being invited to come down here, I I spent the better part of the past week reading and and sort of just polishing up on some things to get ready to come down here. And I, I actually am surprised at the extent. And I, I knew about the species count. I've been following that closely, and from an ecology point of view, that interested me a lot. But I wasn't aware of the number of sites and the number of acres infested. And I was actually honestly surprised at the high figures that I came up with that also uh, corroborate figures that Ian Heap, the reported expert on this internationally has been coming up with um, as well. I, I think we're at that point. And the other thing that I, you know, that, that I, I, I echo the, the concern that Troy expressed about the solution from the company's point of view is pretty far down the tracks. Well, let me, gene, let me. The gene insert uh, train is on the tracks. I was at the University of Nebraska when we hired the director of the Biotech Center, who's Don Weeks, who is the person who received the patent at the University of Nebraska for the dicamba gene that was a contractual arrangement with Monsanto, and that was published in a 2007 science paper announcing this discovery. We're three to four years away from seeing these crops planted in the field. Glyphosate dicamba, glyphosate 2,4-D, and there's been very little discussion. There's been very little science. There's not near enough communication between EPA and APHIS about this. In fact, very little. I was invited down to EPA to talk about work we're doing on this subject about four months ago. And the talk we gave was piped out across to all the EPA labs around the country. And it's clear that there's not enough communication between EPA and APHIS well, well, on let me, how, this is, how this is all progressing. Let me ask you about the, let me ask you about, um, the USDA. Is it in the long-term interest of farmers for the USDA to continue approving new uh, glyph glyphosate-resistant crops like Roundup Ready alfalfa and sugar beets in the complete absence of effective resistant management plants? No. And then, uh, Mr. Uh, Rausch, I think that many people would want to believe that farmers are able to solve the problems of herbicide resistance in weeds on their own. As a farmer, do you agree with that? No, absolutely not. Um, we're working on advice from largely industry anymore. I mean, the public sector, our, our public research is, is, is dead. It's decimated. So, so we're taking the advice of the people that are, that are selling these, these compounds. Um, it's really frustrating. I, I, I got the impression early on that, uh, in, a, in a lot of ways, it, it feels like uh, us farmers are being blamed for this issue, and, and yet we're working on advice from, from industry. And, and it's well, exasperating the problem. Well, well let, me, let, me, let me turn the question a little bit. In your opinion, uh, as a farmer, is it in the long-term interest of farmers to leave the government off the hook for responsibility to prevent proliferation of superweeds? Well, I, I'm, I'm kind of reluctant on that superweed, but uh, resistant well, weed, well, I, let's I accept that, it, that, that term, but okay. Um, no, it, it is not. Um, government has a role, if nothing else, in, 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 in research and education. I'm going to close the door here a minute. Please continue, you were saying. I was, I was just saying that government has a role, if in nothing else, in research and education. Um, 